What up, YouTube? What's wrong with this picture? It's time to brew some beer. What I'm making today is a basic cream ale. Something simple, something nice, light for the summertime. I got my honey weiss in here. You gotta be drinking one to make one. And the nice thing about this particular brew is it's really simple. Simple grain bill, uh, simple additives, quick fermentation. Because as you can see, I got two taps on my Keezer bar doing nothing. That's a problem. I actually be doing something different for this brew. Normally I fly sparge. I used to batch sparge. Before I expanded, I thought fly sparging would be better. So I switched to fly sparging. It is a lot more labor intensive and uh, a lot more time consuming. And there's more room for error because if you walk away for a little bit, which I do doing stuff around the house, you come back and you run too much water into your mush mash time. This time what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna batch sparge, measure my brew house efficiency after this, since I already know what it normally does and see if it does any effect. Because if I can batch sparge and get just the same result, the same flavor and the same efficiency, why am I wasting all this time fly sparging? So you guys are gonna come along with a ride with me. A lot of guys out there are probably like, dude, I already know batch sparge is better, but we'll see. I gotta test it for myself. So I got my strike water up here to 160. We're actually at 163, it's a little bit high. Uh, it's hot outside. Three gallons to start with. So let's get that going. What's gonna be real nice about this is, as I'm prepping to build a electronic controller and convert this whole thing to an electronic system, knowing whether or not I need to batch sparge or fly sparge in the future is really gonna help me set this thing up. Another big benefit to batch sparging, uh, ease of use with these Bayou Classics and with most boil kettles that you get specifically for brewing, they're labeled inside how many gallons are in there. It's gonna make it crazy easy once I've drained the mash ton into the boil kettle to figure out exactly how much water I need to run off of here to, for the recipe to add the proper amount for the, for the batch sparge. And you see what I did there? start talking to you, I almost ran more than three gallons. So now it's time to add the grains. Basic cream ale recipe from Midwest. I'll drop a link in the description if you guys want to try this recipe for yourself. Do miss these brew days. I got all these spare kegs because I prepped. My plan was to always have a keg of something aging, so I never had empty taps. There was a reason for that. My Keezer bar, the refrigerator unit in there, it died. I had to actually swap out the, the freezer, refrigerator, the freezer unit side of that. Really easy swap out because it was a standard size. But during that evolution, I made some upgrades to it. But because of that, obviously I couldn't have any beer on tap. And then life got in the way, got busy, stopped brewing. My temperature is a little bit high based on the weather. I'm gonna add some cold water to this and use this recirculation to cool the wort down to the proper 150, which is what I'm trying to mash in it. 150 for 60 minutes is what the recipe calls for. Nailed it. Right, so let's set this up for recirculation. Flood the system, I'll check my valves. One from here, through here, into here, into there. We're good. Well, my next is to go to two pumps, to have an actual water pump and a work pump. Clean up my plumbing system. I'm trying to simplify all this stuff. So I don't have to move stuff around so much. And the one pump will allow me to get everything on one level, which is big for having a clean brewing system when I, go, when I build my electric controller. You just have three pots, two pumps, everything is controlled by the uh, controller. I don't have to move stuff all around, move heating elements, all that kind of stuff. Just flip switches. We're gonna give this a little bit of time to settle in the temperature and drop down to 150, then we're gonna start our mash timer. Finally got our temperatures balanced out of here, had to drop this tank down a bit in order to get this, the, the actual uh, mash time to drop down. I got my brewmaster assistant here. This is the first time she's helped me with a brew. She doesn't get to taste any of the products, but I think she's understanding the system pretty good. I'm kicking the flame on here because I want to get this back up to 150. 
I dropped it down to cool the work to use it as a cooler. Now that our mash is actually at 150, I've started my timers, I've got that going. Once this is at 152, it'll hold this at 150. Do you want your bakey back? Use your hands. Got to make it work for it. So now we're mashing in and we just bring this up to temperature, let it hold for 60 minutes. And then we'll start the batch part. This is fun. I'm getting this guy up to 150. When I do, this guy spikes up to like 160 something. And I'm losing my mind because I'm thinking mathematically that it don't make no kind of sense, right? And I thought, what if my freaking temperature gauges are bonk? So this one is not. It is reading correct. This one is reading low. A lot low. Like, it's saying, it's telling me right now that it's 160 in here, and it's 145. The interesting thing about this, boys and girls, this and this are both by you classic temp gauges. They're both the ones that come with these pots. This is the newer one. I don't know what to tell you. So I know I've been giving shout out to Bayou Classic, uh, the pots, the kettles are still good to go. The face on this one is yellow. This is the one I got originally. This one is a white faced one. I think they might be sourcing these from someplace different because this one is still showing the correct temperature and it's a much older gauge. This is the youngest gauge. If you buy a Bayou Classic and you get the yellow faced gauge, Maybe check the temperature. Lesson learned, looks like I'm gonna start shopping for digital thermometers. What I do know from the uh, previous brews is that if I keep this two degrees warmer, it'll hold the temperature in there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ignore the gauge over there, which I know is bunk, and I'm gonna keep this at 152, which will keep the mash at 150, if all my calculations and, uh, from previous brews are correct. I mean, I'm not fired up that that gauge failed that fast. This is my not amused face. I think you get it. I went ahead and gave it an extra uh, 20 minutes of the mash time just based on the fact that I'm pretty sure that's what I lost when the temperature dropped or the temperature was being misread, I should say. And now we are well over hour and a half, or hour and 20, sorry, um, of mash time. And I'm gonna go ahead and start doing the, the mash out. This has a mash out of 170. I'm gonna crank the heat up on here, get this up to uh, 170, start our mash out. One eighty. So we blew past 170. It ain't the end of the world. I'm not gonna cool, worry about cooling out my sparge water just because a lot of times I do my mash out at 190 anyway. But that is gold and delicious. Willy Wonka, you need to invent smell -o vision so all my subscribers can enjoy the aromas. All our wort has run off. I got my brewmaster assistant here with me again. So, I'm gonna help you with this. There you go, hold that. Um, you're moving it a lot. I need to run, you know, sweetie, I almost had it. I almost had it, then it's yours. 4.8 gallons. So I'm gonna run 4.8 into here. I'm gonna stir it, and then I'm gonna let it recirculate just like it did for the actual mash for maybe five minutes or so just to clean it up. Then I'm gonna, I'm gonna run it off into the boil cap. And in the meantime, while it's circling, I'm gonna move my flame from underneath the hot liquid tank to the boil kettle so we can start bringing that up to the boil temperature. And then somewhere in there, this little one is gonna go to bed. So you can say bye bye YouTube. I have to add water to bring this up to a boil volume of 6.67 anyway, because with my boil off rate, that is what is required to make sure I'm getting at the end of this. Once I add my yeast starter and rack everything off, I end up with actually five gallons going into the bed. Nice, it's a very simple recipe. Uh, these are just bittering hops. We don't have any flavoring hops for this. One ounce of cluster is what's going in as soon as we hit boil. Hit that for 60 minutes. 
We'll be adding a uh, Wordflick tablet to help just to clear with the clearing, and then our work chiller and all that kind of stuff, 15 minutes out just to sterilize everything. That is 6.7 right there. Hell, I mean, it wasn't that far off. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a boil. So we're gonna turn that bad boy down and add our hops. This is one ounce of cluster. And that is gonna be the only hop addition we have to make. And that goes in for 60 minutes, so let's start our timer. What I do now is I crank up the heat, make sure the, ooh, make sure the boil keeps going. While I sterilize this stuff. The Wurflick tablet. There it is, flame out. When I switch to a all electric system and automate more of this, um, a lot of those systems use a plate chiller. I'm most likely gonna stick with the work chiller. I've heard a lot of issues with the plate chiller or even going with like a counter flow chiller, just clean it out, all that kind of stuff. I like the simplicity of just of just using, just dropping this in, doing the whirlpool. I already got all the plumbing and everything set up for it. I just feel like it's quick and easy. And I don't have to deal with trying to sanitize the inside of the tubing during the cooling process. With a plate chiller and all that kind of stuff, I feel like there's just a higher chance of me getting impurities and other crap in my beer. I mean, tell me what you guys think in the comments. I know people use work they use plate chillers and counter flow chillers with a lot of success. Uh, I just, me, I'm trying to keep the, the cooling side process simple and I'm trying to avoid any sort of infections. And I don't want to have to buy more equipment, but who knows, maybe I will, maybe I'll switch it up here uh, after I get some, some reviews of people saying why I need to switch. I'm always open to grow. I definitely don't know everything there is about gold brewing. We're gonna ferment this at 68. And um, I've already got my fermentation chamber set up at 68. I start that early on in the day, that way it just kind of stabilizes between the heating element and the cooling side before I put this in. It should be pretty clean. Only the one ounce of hop additive. So there should be a lot of trouble. One additive that I, I, I've started putting in here just to check the new system because I did expand the size of this is this uh, an Accurite. What this thermometer or what this temperature gauge does is it also holds a 24 hour high and low so I can see how much this thing's actually fluctuating. Five and a half gallons going into the fermenter. Let's go ahead and pull off the sample. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, why'd you close it up before you pitched the yeast? I'm thinking the same thing. Oh, because it's late. One liter starter with some light DME. I'm gonna wait for my the sample that I pulled to hit room temperature just to make sure that I'm getting a good reading. I'm gonna check my specific gravity, my starting um, specific gravity, and um, log my volume size, calculate my brew house efficiency, hoping it's good, and, and then we wait. Starting gravity, I hit 1.042. For the recipe, the starting gravity was supposed to be 1.038, or a little bit high. I ended up clocking in at 76.8 brew house efficiency overall. I think it's the reason why that's down a little bit. I average about 80 to 85. Not necessarily because I did the batch, but probably because I did the, uh, I screwed up on my volumes. So <clears throat> this was supposed to take 14 days fermented it out fast. I usually have that happen with my yeast starters. Yesterday we hit 1.008. Flavor was good and, and even though this, the target of this was 1.007, I'm pulling it a little bit high because we've already got the alcohol content that we want. I found that by dropping it down to 45 and letting it sit in here for a while, it stops the fermentation, helps it to settle, and I can get exactly the flavor profile that I'm looking for. Some people are will let this ferment until completion, but I found in my experience, this will keep fermenting. It'll end up a little bit too dry for what I want because I do want a little bit of sweetness in this cream ale. If I let it just go until it's done, I've found that most of my beers end up very, very high alcohol content, but the flavor isn't exactly what I want. The advantage of having a fermentation chamber like this is it does allow you to cold crash it 
and stop the fermentation once the flavor gets exactly where you want it and you're not at the mercy of trying to throw chemicals in there to kill the yeast off. So now we'll let this sit like this for a little bit, let it clear. There it is, the cream ale finished out, 4.4%, very light beer. I got some great compliments on, on it from my friends, but for my personal taste, I like my home brews to be a little bit more complex. This is a very simple cream ale recipe. I do think that this is a great base for some adventures. And the nice thing about it is with it having such a low base ABV, when you start adding in other additives to it, honey, sugar, stuff like that, where it still has some fermentables in it, it doesn't really bump it up to a level where it's not like a nice summertime beer. I'm still gonna use this one, obviously. I'm gonna drink it, because you know I have a party, my friends come over, they're gonna crush this stuff. But as far as just making this again, I probably won't. There's nothing inherently wrong with the beer. It's just very simple for what I like to have on tap in my homebrew. Thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe to follow my channel for future videos and keep homebrewing.